Okay. Let me see. Um, that I think is going. So, hi everyone. I don't know if anyone's found us yet. Oh, looks like there's a couple. Oh, yeah, four people. Um, that's pretty good for my way. So, um, <laughs> so welcome to the the first uh, of many. I hope perception and action journal club. The idea of this is, you know, just to get a few people to uh, together to talk about some interesting papers. And I'm gonna record it and get some easy podcast material too. That's part of my goal. Um, so the, and then um, I think on YouTube and the, um, the uh, no, not both on YouTube and Facebook, you can post comments and they'll show up to us. So if you have any questions or comments later on. So, um, so before we get to start on the article, I thought we'd I'll go around the room, the virtual room. So um, see if we can start brief introduction of, of who we all are. So obviously I'm Rob Gray from Arizona State University in the Perception Action Podcast. So Marianne, if you want to give a Hi, brief introduction. Sorry. Hi, my, my name is Marianne Davies. I'm, um, so my, my background is primarily adventure sports as a, as a coaching coach developer. And um, I'm doing a PhD with um, Keith Davids and also with Jane Williams at Hartbury University, sort of exploring models of skill acquisition for equestrian sports coaching, obviously from a, an ecological dynamics perspective. And um, I'm also a senior coach developer with UK Coaching, which is very exciting. Wow, that sounds that sounds like interesting stuff. <laughs> uh, ben, mine's not as interesting as that, but um, <laughs> I'm, I'm from Canterbury Christchurch University in the UK. I'm a part PhD, part teaching staff there, and most of my work kind of looks at um, perception, action, coupling in elite sports people. Um, at the moment, well, my previous work was in in goalkeepers for my masters. Um, so I'm writing some bits up now with Will, with Will Roberts and um, Keith Davids. I'm kind of doing my PhD around affordance space control and kind of really getting into the nitty gritty ecological stuff. Um, but yeah, that's about it. That's cool. That's far as yeah, it's gone at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> that that all sounds <laughs> really good stuff. Yeah, uh, I was just actually um, I'm trying to get uh, Brett Fage in to come on and do an interview about uh, mm -hmm. affordance space control, but. He's too involved in administrative things with right now. So eventually I'll get him on. Okay. Yeah. So today we want to talk, we're going to talk about, if I can quickly, this uh, paper uh, that uh, scaling sports equipment for children promotes functional movement and variability. Um, it's by Tim Buzzard and Damien Farrow and the, all the colleagues at the AIS, Australian Institute of Sport, who do all that really awesome stuff. Uh, first of all, how cool is it that this paper got into nature? The uh, skill acquisition rate research doesn't always, especially one that uses real sports instead of something reaching, or, you know, not that that stuff doesn't have value. But um, so what I thought I would start off, you know, uh, maybe this is kind of a loaded question, but so what they did in the study obviously was to uh, take kids and give them uh small smaller rackets and and different tennis balls to to practice tennis so i wanted to ask kind of a loaded question to start is this uh, a constraints led approach manipulation what what are your thoughts on that i'm going to say anything which changes some form of a parameter is technically constraints led approach so anything can be constraints led approach and I know that got shut down quite a lot, but. <laughs> <laughs> I would agree with that because we're changing the, um, we're kind of changing the relationship between the performer and their environment through through the equipment, through changing the equipment. Yeah, no, I think that's a great, I agree too. I think this is a great example of why in the word constraint is sometimes not the best, right? Because we're not actually re limiting the kids. We're actually giving them more. Uh, they're giving them more opportunities. So it's a great example of constraining to afford, right? Mm. By giving them, they're not taking away things. Well, maybe taking away reaching to a further ball because <laughs> the racket's shorter. But so what kind, in the, the pyramid, what kind of constraint is this? Would you put it? <laughs> Probably an easy question. <laughs> <laughs> 
task? Do we win points if we get these questions right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. There's no, I don't know the answer. Actually. I'm just wondering if people tell us off if we get it wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I kick you off. Um, yeah, no, uh, well, I, I find this a little bit confusing. Like some people are inconsistent. Uh, well, I think the way I think of it doesn't agree with the way Carl, I would call it a task constraint too equipment but i think you described it perfectly marianne it's really causing the interaction between individual and the task to change right yeah. so i think sometimes we we put too much emphasis on categorizing it when it's these things all interact so um so i guess do you want i don't know do you want to give kind of a an overall impression of what you thought about the study maybe to to start um now that i've done my quiz <laughs> um ben do you want to yeah, um, I've really, really like the paper. Um, I'm going to try and be really critical of it just because it will help me understand it a bit more. But mm -hmm. um, one of my bigger concerns was that in terms of this, this um, scaling equipment, how does that really transfer as, if we look more longitudinally, as they continue to grow and then end up using typical sports equipment how does that how does that initial learning phase of learning to these new constraints of the scaled equipment actually transfer later on down the line um that was my first observation that was under question but in terms of the the actual setup and studies seems really effective i like the use of the decompressed ball as well to um kind of alter the coupling between the I know, they may briefly mention it, but don't really build on it briefly, but kind of a perceptual system as well, because there has to be that element of coupling between the perceptual and the system. Um, and it's also really clear the differences. I think in terms of multiple joint couplings, it's hard to argue against the findings, which is always nice to see, I think, in this, this style of research, especially where a forehand is still kind of a novel skill to an extent. Um, it's not super, it's not massively dynamic or massively relying on loads of external properties. So it's interesting to see this big difference in, in still quite a relatively niche, small, novel task. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I agree. Marianne, do you have a... Yeah, I, 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 I likewise, I really like the paper. And like I say, I, I like the fact that it was really clear. I, I found it fascinating, the increase in the sort of coupling with the limbs mm -hmm. as well, and that obviously releasing degrees of freedom. And it kind of made me think about part of that could possibly also be psychological as well. You know, it's sometimes quite hard to unpick all those different bits. But from my perspective, it really made me think about the experiences I have particularly with things like paddle sports where there isn't that there are sort of um not not such set equipment so you can buy different boats and paddles and things etc mm -hmm. and I'll, and just how different performance is as a and certainly as a woman or somebody who's not kind of built like your average olympian and realizing that's mm -hmm. how they create the boats and what they do is they scale them to size which kind of made me think a little bit more about this rather mm. than scale to proportions. So when I first worked with Canoe Wales, I was really lucky to spend some time with one of the guys that designed the Piranha boats. And the first thing they did was move my seat forward and put a little booster cushion on it so that I had more weight above my boat instead of inside it. As a typical woman, I've not got such big shoulders and i am kind of got more weight down. And the difference was phenomenal. So even though my weight was correct, my kind of my my build wasn't mm -hmm. so the scaling wasn't just to size and the same with the first time i had a mountain bike that was designed for women i went oh that can't really make much difference but it was phenomenal yeah so, no i yeah, think those are great great that. points <laughs> <laughs> um i think they're both you both raised really good points uh, uh, ben the the transfer of what ha what happens when you go back to regular adult size mm. equipment you know, I, as far as I know, none of the studies, like there's a, quite a few studies on scaling equipment for kids, right? But yeah. as far as I know, and no one's looked at that. And um, I, I also think Mary, the the point about, it's not just the size, it's actually the, the scale and the arrangement. And the Because I, I believe there's one scaling study where they gave, they, they actually used, I think, four different rackets that 
for and they they tried to match it based on the kid's height and but it was too simple it's not that simple like you were saying it's not just yeah, so, not that so yeah and um so in this study i i think the methodology right they they were just doing tossing were they just hand tossing the ball to the yeah under, yeah under, under arm yeah and they were doing forehand strokes in a biomechanics lab um, um with it was a lot within subjects design with and without with a smaller racket and a less compressed ball and um with an because uh, compared to an adult racket and, and a regular mm -hmm. tennis ball yeah do they i i don't know did do, do do they give any inst i can't remember are there any instructions at all to the obviously the, i don't think these are complete novices right they've played tennis before i think it was to hit a um, time What's that? Yeah. yeah. They're, they're but I, what I meant is, have they had any coaching at all about how to swing a tennis racket? Like how you're, any kind of the traditional explicit, you know? So it's not purely here, pick this up and hit the ball. I think they have had some regular, normal, traditional coaching before this. Yeah. Yeah. They've all, they've all come, come from Tennis Australia's Hot Shots program. So some kind of coaching center thing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they know what tennis is for those things. Yeah, so it's not like pure novices starting out with self organization <laughs> completely. Obviously, okay. they they've had some foundation. Um, let me kind of try to share my screen a bit, so we can. I think that's there's not much else to the actual methods. I think it's pretty straightforward, right? It's all really in the analysis. I think. Mm -hmm. so let me see if I can put up if I can get this to work. Okay, there's my, let's see. Oh, there we go, fancy. Okay, so I put up, so this is, um, so a lot of what they were measuring, and then let me go. I think this is, uh, a lot of what they were measuring was the variability, right? Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that, you know, I would recommend when you, if you're reading a paper and, and is really, you have to be clear, what kind of variability are you talking about, right? Is it the variability between uh, shots? Like, so if you take with, between shots within one person, between the group of people, like you take the ab, or or within a single stroke, right? So, um, so this is um, this is one of the, the the really nice figures. So this is what they were doing is plotting the variance in the forearm and the upper arm. Right, and I think this was within a tennis stroke, right? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And the um, the so they're what they're showing there. This they're really in this paper. They're really framing this all in t in terms of Bernstein's the degree of freedom problem, right? You have to figure out what you need to do with your upper arm and your forearm, um, and coordinate yeah. them in some way. Um, and what they're showing, what they're basically showing there. So, do you want to, uh, Marianne? Do you want to kind of? talk through one of these figures is there anyone kind of that caught your eye in particular um i think what um what really came across to me there was that um how how the, the shoulder was re you know released obviously more in the um in the scaling ones so they were able to move more fluidly and they had that um uh, coupling of the shoulder and the forearm rather than just holding the shoulder still and trying to just move the forearm to control to control what the, what happened with the ball and I, that was um like I said that was really interesting because part of that can can be feeling you know that the, the, there can also be an you know um psychological aspect to that feeling more confident you just kind of relax a little bit as well so um, but it was really that for me, that was really interesting, especially kind of one of the things I, you know, really interested in is in how do we how do how do we um, promote an earlier uncoupling of those freezing degrees of freedom? Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I, if I remember correctly, a lot of the original studies, not only do they have a performance benefits, so you hit more winners, you hit harder. But I think there is also kind of strategical, like you're saying, psychological there. They hit the ball earlier. They play yeah. more aggressive shots. They there's they hit in front of the baseline more. Yeah. Um, so I think I think you're right. There's it's more to it than just a coordination change, right? Um, how but about you, bit, Ben? Any? Yeah, the bit I quite love that's been drawn out of this <coughs> is where typically I know a lot of the 
arguments against self-organization is that it, nothing can just be randomly spontaneous. But the, the point they make around how the upper and forearm kind of coupledness in relation to the um, in relation to the angle of the tennis racket or the distance of the tennis racket and it's, so it's, still, it's still organized around that kind of set parameter still so mm -hmm. how they self-organize based on that you can even call it a constraint to still get that kind of functional movement variability um with the scaled equipment as well but don't know if i had that in a figure did they yeah um i'm trying to find so this one, I just I mentioned, you know, the way that I, I interpret this one. So this is the variability in your forearm position versus the variability in your upper arm. And basically what you can, like, what you see is the blue triangles. And the, the basically your forearm isn't varying, right? The, the points are almost in a perfect vertical line, right? So mm -hmm. there, there's, that's what they, that's where their evidence of freezing, right? You're, you're, the person is choosing not to do anything with their forearm. Right, they're, they're basically doing the same thing all through the whole thing. Yeah. What they're doing every, instead is, um, and with scaling, right, and they're doing everything is involved in the upper arm, right, with the blue dots, which has a huge variance, right. But the the when they switch to the scale, you have both things involved, right. So that's a really really nice clear example of going from freezing to freeing, right. Um, you're using the forearm way more than you did before. And you and so there's two things. You're using a different joint more, and you're also you're right. You're Marion, it's coupled, right? It's it's they're nice high correlate. They're correlated with other, each other. They're moving together. Um, I think the one you're talking, we guys, the one you were talking about, maybe this one where you have the actual kind of shoulder to racket, or, or uh, were you uh, talking? Yeah, about? Yeah. Distance, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the this is so if we're you're. Um, if we're going to get critical, you know, we, we, we should critique these uh, papers. The one that this is one of these almost is bordering on these kind of figures that people make fun of when they try to do a correlation, right? That it, that's a really questionable thing to fit a straight line to, the, the red <laughs> thing, right? Uh, that doesn't look very linear to me. Uh, I, I understand what they were doing, but looks like there's something more complicated going on than a linear relationship, right? It almost looks like two clusters, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. That there's a little vector. Yeah. And they do to their to their to be fair, they do go on to do more than correlations, but um th th that that is a kind of a questionable fit there, even though it's significant. Yeah. Um but th yeah, so the um this again, just kind of basically showing the same thing where when you have the scaled equipment, you're taking in both uh, both uh, joints you're using freeing. Um, is this the one you're, I, mean, I don't know if this was the one you're kind of talking about as well. I like this one's really cool too. Um, this one's showing, this is kind of uh, showing the actual uh, swing from start to, to hitting the ball. Um, so the blue one, um, is the when you're using the full size racket. So this is this is uh, you know this is state space essentially, mm -hmm. right? All that this is all the possible places your body could be to to do this task. And here's where you choose to do with a full size racket. It just looks so. <laughs> it doesn't. It looks so. You know, you're not using all the available state, right, to to do the task. You're using a really narrow range of options. Whereas this one. Wow, you're really <laughs> opened up <laughs> and exploring the environment. Whether you know, maybe that doesn't always use um, uh, yeah. you know, results in better performance, but in this case, it does. Yeah. And that visual line on the blue one just looks really constrained, doesn't it? It looks like it's being really controlled. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's what they're trying to show in this yeah. uh, this little graph here. That you, it's again, it's because you're 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 free. You're doing everything with one part of the body. Yeah. And it, it, at first, until the very end, when you have to, to kick in the other part. Yeah. So in terms of why that happens, so I, I say I'm a, I'm a tennis coach. I've done I've ever played tennis ever, but is that because they have the ability to to freeze because they're afforded more possibilities from the racket being bigger and having a bigger surface area? So they, they they can get away with doing less with their body because the size of the racket affords them the ability to almost be lazy in terms of the actual movements they deliver 
that, that's yeah that's interesting because my my interpretation would be that they're unable to control it as well so they're needing to give themselves as little as possible to try and control so they'll freeze as many of the degrees of freedom as they can maybe because it's a little more cumbersome or they're, they're not confident about it um, it's like me playing golf the only thing i move is my wrist like the rest of me doesn't move otherwise i just take out a chunk of the grass you know but it's because i haven't got the ability to control all of those different degrees of freedom yeah. i'm just thinking the so, nature of the of the setup <laughs> where it's a underarm throw to a point and a forearm could it could just be literally a forearm movement if the serve is relatively stable in terms of the underarm throw goes to a similar position they could get away with just moving the forearm and relying on the racket just yeah. wonder what design causes some of this yeah, I guess that's a fair question. You know, what yeah. what kind of feedback are they getting, right? Maybe you're right that this is sometimes this is called, you know, the term people use is satisficing, right? Maybe if yeah. there's really, they're not playing a match, all they're doing is, well, I guess they're hitting a target, right? So they're getting feedback about how effective, but yeah. you're right, maybe just the form is good enough, right? There's not much, <laughs> what you, are you kind of getting at a mo maybe a motivation, you know? You don't have much motivation to try different things possibly and just for, for the to solve the task really easily just moving the forearm in a very limited way with a normal size racket may just may, may be able to solve the task quite easily with that limited movement and the more if it's the, the more scaled equipment may even require them to be more let's see active but maybe so, so the scale for example if the scaled equipment requires them to to have to put more power in that that perhaps would work possibly i'm just yeah i'm, I'm just i'm just thinking about them, the method itself yeah yeah no, no that that mm -hmm. that's a good good are great questions why why do you freeze and why do you freeze what is the the actual stimulus right um is it something is that kind of motivational you see you know that you're not doing effectively and you change um we probably wouldn't think in most cases it's conscious right you're that you're gonna i'm not gonna move my <laughs> arm you probably really can't do that in most cases but um and then you know or is it just kind of more giving you more uh you just suddenly pick up the smaller racket and you can swing it in different ways and so it leads you to trying different things yeah awesome yeah, and with, yeah. A, with a, maybe a slower bouncing ball, and a, and it bounced lower, didn't it? So they could reach it. Gives them a lot more time, mm -hmm. as well, and and maybe feels as if it's going to be more um, attainable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think these are all good points, right? We, it's more than just a coordinate. Uh, you know, this this having more op more um, options and for for the action i think there's the, there's still a human being attached to it right with that so <laughs> beside all this yeah um is there any other ones um i uh, i don't i don't know whether this is um would be of interest but I, one of the things i do a lot in in paddling especially if people have sort of developed um a particular way of um doing something so a particular maybe a particular um paddle stroke is that I will give them a paddle that actually doesn't allow them to do that anymore. So maybe a wing paddle or, or just a single blade instead of a double one. So I'm using, I'm, I'm changing that equipment. It, it's kind of a little bit like the scaling so that it disrupts what they do normally. Mm -hmm. They have to sort of search for a different, slightly different solution, but it's not hugely different. It's just a little bit different. So I, I might weight it, for example, mm. which would be like, I'll give them a longer or shorter one. Yeah, no, that that's a good, that's a good, yeah. I think that's more of an example of what people kind of think with the constraints where you take something away. And I, I kind of agree with you, Ben, too. I'm I'm not sure, I don't play enough tennis to know what would happen <laughs> if you do, when you do this. If, if you tried to swing exactly the same way with a smaller racket and a decompressed ball, what would happen? I'm not sure. <laughs> I just wonder whether, have they used scaled equipment before? So if anything, the, the normal size racket was actually the intervention and yeah, therefore exactly. a more stable, almost novice-like response to using that equipment, hence the freezing of, of certain degrees of freedom. Yeah. 
or if it's more responsive, like the ball bounces more, that's what I'm trying to get to you at, that it responds more than they're likely to constrain what they do a little bit. Whereas if they're the softer ball, they can sort of like, you know, they've got more, um, that there's, there's a little bit more um, variance is taken up by them giving it a good whack, you know, where the, the bouncy ball, they're gonna be aware that's, that, that they can't get away with it as much. Mm -hmm. That's a fair point. Yeah, that's an interesting one. Yeah, and I, I think they're both points. And I think the 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 next step, obviously, that we're kind of missing here is the learning piece, right? Um, seeing how it changes from these two states over time. Um, uh, obviously, you know, you can't do everything. I hate, I hate when people you write up do a great paper and people just why didn't you do this and that. And, you know, you know, especially in a nature one where you, they give you a super <laughs> word limit. <laughs> so, um, but that's obviously the next, you know, trying to map, you know, understanding how these, you go from one to the other, you know, you're right, Ben, where did they start? Um, this is really measuring performance with these two pieces of constraints rather than uh, how constraints, constraints shape skill acquisition. Yeah. Mm. Um, I don't know if there's any, I think that's, you know, I don't know if there's any, I pulled, there's a, one other, um, there's a bit of extra material you can go online and get uh, for this that yeah. I kind of pulled out. Um, this one figure um, is, sh is showing, um, it's interesting, I I'm always interested, like how these things change across the course of the, the actual movement. Um, the, um, so the, um, they did a really nice job showing kind of how the two things are balanced with each other. I think this was, this is what this figure is trying to show. Um, the bottom one is the is the um, scaled, and going along zero basically means the the two things are upper arm and forearm are doing equal work, right? It's not till the very end that one kind of takes over, whereas yeah. in the the standard one, the right from the start one is taking over again. So they do and they do a nice job of showing this this kind of this freezing. Uh, freeing thing in in multiple different ways. I think um, the the other one and kind of this these measure of these vectors. Right, they show uh, um, how you know you can see the the scaled one has you know equal contribution. Um, no, uh, the the word I would use is, you know you said coupling, Marianne. It's a yeah. it's a syner it's a motor synergy too, right? The two yeah. things are working together um, to compensate for each other, um, whereas. Um, in the blue one in the bottom, it's almost all the uh, the um, forearm, right? There's yeah. there's a um, shift before. Yeah, I think for me that was the thing that was really interesting in it because I, I I guess and this is this is it'll be interesting with your question, Ben, that if they you know by getting used to um, having um, a, a much more coupled movement pattern. Um, hopefully, even when they do transfer to to a sort of full size bit of equipment, they've developed um, a coordination pattern. You know, they've had the opportunity to develop a more um, functional coordination pattern that that involves more of their more of their body. Well, I think we lost. Oh, there's. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. No, I think that's really. And do you do you find that, Marianne, in your manipulations when you when you do change the you know positioning or you mentioned taking away with a different paddle after you give them the other equipment back do they does it kind of change the way they use the regular equipment do you find kind of transfer effect um yeah they're usually just much more um much more confident and playful with it mm -hmm. and, and again it's really difficult sort of unpicking the reasons but i think be, just by um you know learning to use something slightly different and um and, and some of it's psychological, letting go of having to do something maybe that they thought they had to, trying to um, adhere to some technical template that, that they've been coached in in the past. So there's lots of little bits in there. But, yes, generally, um, you know, and I do encourage a much more playful way of being. So one of the things is, you know, sort of like be, that when it's disrupted, they're not worried about their performance because I know they know that I've kind of like taken up I've changed it so that there's sort of like less pressure mm -hmm. if that makes sense so when they yeah definitely up, yeah um <laughs> you've kind of moved sometimes moving it away from the yeah. uh, competition environment although 
we say, oh, that's less representative maybe, but I, I you know, yeah. it, lets, it lets people relax a bit more, feel like they can play around. I agree, yeah. Yeah, and usually when they go back, yeah, I, I don't think I've ever had anyone that doesn't go back and just be much more playful and competent with, with what they've had before or, ch or change it or go, actually, this isn't the right size paddle for me. I'm gonna, you know, my maybe the equipment I'm using isn't as good as it could be. So, but but there's a beauty of that sport that they, that you know, that you can change those things. But, but definitely, I think almost we have to unconstrain people's minds as much as their bodies. <laughs> mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah, it's that sometimes you know, the term psychological safety, right? You got to let people Absolutely. feel it's comfortable to make mistakes and mess around. And yeah, and yeah. not always be perfect. Um, ben, and, you're, not, you're... and not be locked into a technical template to use. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard not to um, to get out of that mindset. Ben, you you meant you're kind of a what, you, what can you can we talk about this paper in terms of affordances? I don't know if they really mention um, anything in terms of affordances in the paper. No, they don't really. They try to be quite theoretically neutral to an extent. I think I think they're quite clever with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe they uh maybe that was a response to reviewers. You never know. <laughs> yeah. um, get the nature though. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Whatever you have to do. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I think affordance is an interesting one because possibly, well, if you freeze degrees of freedom, you'd argue that perhaps there's less affordances to maybe take advantage of, but I guess just just like more channeled towards a a, a less um, broad solution bandwidth or solution manifold. So maybe there's less to act on. Um, that's some of the stuff coming out of some of the stuff I'm writing at the moment is around experts having these quite broad perceptual motor solution uh, bandwidth so how they can be successful within like a spectrum of different behaviors so i'm going to deviate a little bit but the stuff that is on the, on the quiet eye <laughs> and the quiet eye has been assumed to be this there's this optimal timings of the the final fixation but what we found with some expert goalkeepers in more representative tasks is that they can kind of operate in these bandwidths where the timing is kind of irrelevant as long as it's within these kind of parameters of within X percentage and Y percentage based on, theoretically speaking, what they're able to do. So I think uh, Matt Dix and his work started to push this in terms of a, a quicker goalkeeper will have a slightly different timing of their fixation to a slower goalkeeper based on how they interact with that environment. So it's interesting here in terms of scaling that equipment and what that does to the affordances that are able to be acted upon. And it's interesting, I just wonder whether there could be a slightly more individual, individualized analysis of this in terms of the scaling against the actual anthropometrics of each individual. I mean, I'm, asking a bit too much of the paper no <laughs> no i think that's a really really yeah, interesting that that mm -hmm. yeah i know some people have kind of critiqued the quiet eyes you know it's basically teaching one technique right you have to look for this long yeah uh, which kind of goes against a lot of self-organization so i think that's an interesting uh concept um yeah, I think the affordance, I don't know. I I think part of the, you know, the stuff you were talking about, Marianne, people changing their strategy, like being playing the ball earlier in front of the baseline, you could argue those are all afforded things by the new racket. Maybe it's something as simple. You, yeah. yeah. You can just if you if it's lighter, you can just swing it faster. Right. If you have a faster swing, you you don't need as much time to set up. You you can you can get to different places, right? So you just you can imagine it's affording different things. Um, yeah. I've got a question from somebody. Woo. Um, someone is asking. I don't know if any of if, if any of us has played with this. Is looking at using kind of an overload constraint. So um, using heavier than normal, maybe paddle in your case, bat, baseball bat in my case, or um, kind of asking what's kind of the sweet spot in terms of how much heavier. Um, I don't know if anyone has any. Uh, you know, do we want to? Yeah. I've certainly used that. Um, actually, the the, mo the the most time I use something like that is actually um, to make to get to create drag on a boat. So um, even even you know sort of putting something like a tire or something behind to pull. But what that does is allow someone um, to connect through the body and use much more of their body. 
Mm-hmm. So again, it, it, it's kind of a, I've never thought of it as an unfreezing degrees of freedom, but it sort of creates a connectivity because you have to then actually use your entire body and connect from your feet right through to your your hands. Whereas if there's no if there's no resistance, you can just sort of just use a little bit. And so those degrees of freedom, like Ben was saying, you can get away with it. Mm-hmm. So powering up and using um, a weight sort of almost forces the system to recruit more of the coordination in order to be able to resolve that problem. And I use that a lot to create connectivity. Mm-hmm. I don't think there is any, there's nothing on really practitioner guidelines of if you are going to scale equipment of how much buy or to what extent or in relating to, to what other variables. Mm-hmm. I guess just throw some things at, at the environment and see what happens, I guess. <laughs> yeah, be there. yeah, definitely. I think um, you're right. Uh, you know, I've done a bit with, you know, heavier bats and things like that. Uh, the, only, the only observation I can contribute is, you know, sometimes what I found is it can be unnoticeable almost to the person consciously and still have effects on their actual, you know, how they coordinate and things. So you don't have to go super heavy right away, I think. <laughs> and obviously you want to be careful with that in certain sports. So, um, you know, I'd start small. Um, I, I guess if, if you really know what you want to change, like you were talking about, Marianne, then maybe you can do some sort of, sort of calculation. But other than that, you're right, Ben. You're right, Ben. Just yeah. guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yes. And, and I guess... I guess it's thinking about why, what you're getting out of it. What is it? What is it that that will um, get the the learner to search? What perceptual motor workspace do they need to explore by you doing that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, um, you're right. That, and I think, like I've always, I always try to. That's what differentiates constr- differentiates the constraints led approach from pure differential learning for me. Is, yeah. You know. Um, and and then that, that, that's why I would call this constraint. It's not, it's not differential learning, obviously. You're changing the racket specifically to try well, to perfect. achieve something. Yeah. Change, yeah. 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 To try to open up performances. Yeah. Um, so maybe wrapping up, you know, the, so I think I, I, I picked this article. I like this article because not only is, I, I, I don't think it just applies to developmental issues in kids. I think it, it's a good test of one of the, main arguments of the constraints led approach, right? What, sh- yeah. what sh- we should see when you add constraints. So I, I think it really does advance. You know, everyone complains about where's the evidence for the constraints led approach. I'm like, give us time, give us time. And I think this is a good step, yeah. Um, so I don't know, do you have any kind of, uh, you know, comment, kind of general comments about about that this area and kind of how this fits in or where we need to go? I don't. I'd like to preempt a question that I know might be fired at this. Okay. is um what does this look like longitudinally mm-hmm. because and it's, it's it's a fair criticism there's not a great deal of longitudinal stuff looking at the impact of constraints on self-organizing tendencies or changing the perceptual motor landscape etc so what does this look like in terms of also appreciating the more organismic or individual personal constraints over time as well as kind of the more immediate um actual task constraints impact in the performer environment system practically basically immediately so how do you kind of balance those two yeah i agree that's uh, i agree those are both uh, i think part of their issue is those are really challenging things to measure <laughs> Um, and now, like, I know I'm struggling with this now too. Everything I learned about research and statistics falls out the window when trying yeah. to, to measure and quantify individual learning, right? It's so yeah. difficult. And I think that's part of the thing you see here, you know, with me picking on their correlation, you know, you see there's a lot more going on there and we're trying to hammer, we're trying to wrench it into, you know, the things we know and the, the methods that are out there are so they're pretty challenging unless you're a math wizard, <laughs> like uncontrolled manifold analysis or something. It's, it's pretty yeah. hard to just pick up and do. Um, so, yeah, I think those are those are great points. Um, I think, you know, other people might, you know, a wonderful thing to see. I would have loved to see, you know, and again, uh, I hate when people do this, but adding wish you had done more in your paper is what would this look like if you had one uh, with just instructions? Uh, adult, here's an adult racket. I want you to swing it like this. Uh, co- expert coach, would you see similar 
you know, ch changes in the coordination pattern? Would you or not? You know, that I think that's well, those these kind of direct comparisons of methods to, uh, you know, I think we need more of as well. Um, you maybe have to touch on some of the more, it may be intentional focus stuff and look at the more the psychological aspect as well, then it becomes a bit more integrated and slightly more coupled. Yeah. Yep. So how about you, Marianne? Do you have any kind of general? <laughs> <laughs> I think I think again, sort of go back to to sort of where I was thinking when I started, and you know, uh, and I think it's maybe just being a woman and spending a lot of my time, you know, using equipment and stuff that's not designed for for me. That you know, it, it, this is great that it's in kids, but also um, it uh, it really applies to that whole concept that that scaling and 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 it, and it's. Um, yeah, that it's really interesting. The other areas that it can be applied to, and it, I, I'm kind of thinking it's a shame that when they started, you know, um, making uh, certainly event sports equipment and clothing for women because we couldn't even move in the kit that we had before because mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not the same shape as the average bloke. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, that 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 somebody wasn't doing research on the effect that that had because I kind of go like suddenly there's you know a lot more women are paddling and they're they're getting better at it and things and it and you know how much of that is the fact that the kit was actually just something they weren't having a fight with and how much of it was that there were other people in there and um yeah <laughs> yeah no I I think that's really interesting yeah um I kind of got a taste of that when I when I first started doing driving research like safety issues with you know having women uh you know average size women are closer to the front of a car you know uh, with the airbag not changing the airbag and yeah so i i think there's really a lot of things that applies yeah. to yeah so well i think that was a a good uh first attempt at this uh, thank you very much guys for coming i was watching i think we had at least 25 people watching at one point so uh, it's pretty good uh, um so i hope you got how are you guys uh holding up in the uh quarant what self uh <laughs> stay at home whatever you want to call it environment um I'm I'm gonna I, I'm thinking I might start learning how to play golf because I've I've been quarantined at my family's place, which is mm -hmm. which is fabulous. But there's a bike park and a pump track and the horses and the show jumping, and I'm thinking oh, I'm not supposed to be doing that in case I get injured. And then there's this beautiful golf course that's empty outside my window, and I've never been interested in golf, so I'm <laughs> contemplating. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had the exact same thought actually. <laughs> There's a golf course across the road from me, and I keep looking now, and I see, you see the people. As long as you stay away from the 19th hole, the bar, right? <laughs> golf is like a perfect sport for this, right? You have small yeah. groups of people that know each other that are separated by yards and yards of fair. So I, yeah. I'm not at high risk of being injured and having to be taken to A&E and explain why I was doing something I wasn't supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> so... Okay, uh, thanks very much, guys. And uh, I'll definitely try to organize another one of these um, sometime soon. And uh, if anyone listening is is interested in being one of the discussants next time, uh, please contact me in some way. So uh, I think we'll sign off for now and, and I'll, I'll be have, releasing this as a podcast uh, later on. So thanks, guys. I'm going to end this.